I will. Good evening. Welcome to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and the first in a series of candidate forums across the state, brought to you by the University of Tennessee System, its campuses, and USA Today Network Tennessee. It is an honor to host all of the gubernatorial and congressional candidates participating this evening. As the state's flagship land-grant university, UT Knoxville is deeply committed to fostering civic engagement and meaningful debate. I want to thank everyone who will be on the stage, in the audience, or who is watching from home. Whether you are casting a ballot or putting your name on one, your participation in the democratic process is so important. Our government works best when everyone is informed, engaged, and an active participant in the democratic process. That is why we are here tonight. I also want to thank the USA Today Network, particularly David Plazas and Michael Anastasi, the Knoxville News Sentinel, and UT System President Randy Boyd for their leadership in organizing this series of forums across the state. Now, please join me in welcoming Governor Bill Lee and USA Today Network Region Editor Michael Anastasi for a conversation.
Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Thank you, counselors. It's a pleasure to be here at campus of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Let's get started. Thank you, Monica. So, Governor, you just a few moments ago signed a bill. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that, and we'll go from there. Uh, the Institute for American Civics at the University of Tennessee, we just signed that bill. It is to establish uh, an institute that is accessible to University of Tennessee students, but also to the broader public in Tennessee. It's really designed to provide education um, around the ideas and the institutions that make our country great, that make Tennessee great. The importance of understanding them, the importance of protecting them, institutions like uh, our constitutions, our separation of powers, uh, our system of federalism, those are the tenets of the foundation of this country and we, we want to educate ourselves to remind ourselves and make sure that we protect those institutions. So that's what this institute's about. It'll be a model for the country here at the university. And one other thing, it really provides uh, an opportunity to recognize and educate students on the importance of public discourse and the ability to have different opinions, different ideas, different uh, thoughts, and to be able to discuss those in a civil way and to be able to learn to disagree in a way that allows people to move forward. Um, it's going to be a, a real opportunity for us in Tennessee. I'm very proud of the fact that we've got it. So a lot of people across the country have had some trouble in the area of civil discourse. Uh, as a leader of a state, how do you model that? You know, I think that it is very important that we understand that uh, that differing opinions are actually really valuable. It's part of what makes our democracy so unique and so great is the ability for people to express themselves, the reason we have uh, the right of speech. And to be able to engage in disagreement and speech with one another without um, without toxicity, without divisiveness. There's inherently some of that in, in division, I mean, in disagreement, but it doesn't have to be that way. We've had 200 years in this country of differences of opinion and a very sharply uh, divided ideas, but the ability to move forward in, in a, really in a dignified and civil manner is very important. I, I try to do that. You asked how you model that. I think first is recognizing it, talking about it, uh, elevating the importance of it, and then engaging in it. Well, thank you. So let's dive into some, uh, some recent news. Uh, the legislative session recently ended, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the biggest uh, accomplishment from that is the change in the Tennessee education formula. Why was that necessary? Why did you push for that? You know, when I was uh, in the private sector before I ever became interested in politics and running for office, I, um, I was interested in education because I worked in, specifically in inner city at-risk youth programs where uh, I saw a variety of students with tremendous um, barriers to their success. I got very interested in that, mentored kids from the inner city, got involved in their education and understanding the importance of public education and the importance of appropriate funding. It's something that I've long believed in and long thought we should look hard at. When I began, when I began to run for office, people asked me from the very beginning on campaign trail, what are you gonna do about the BEP? And I didn't know the complexities of the BEP, but I knew that there were very few people who thought it was the best plan forward. It's a 30-year-old funding formula. If we're gonna educate our kids in public education, the vast majority of our kids are, we should appropriately fund it. That's why we added a billion dollars to the funding for our public schools this year. But then make sure that if we're going to fund it, we do it in a way that is modernized, that recognizes 
children instead of systems. So we set up a student-centered funding model. We, we did so with the help of thousands of Tennesseans. We started a process six months earlier to engage stakeholders. And we came up with a formula that recognizes the uniqueness of every child, whether it has a child with disabilities, a child in poverty, a child in a rural community, attaches dollars to that child, and then subsequently funds that child as they go to a public school of their, of their, uh, in their area. It is exciting. It was bipartisan effort put together by Tennesseans of all types, and it was long overdue and I'm very hopeful for our public school system, uh, but for this mechanism that I think is gonna more appropriately fund kids. So no one has a crystal ball, no one knows right. how it's gonna turn out, right? Uh, how do you, how, do, how, how is it designed for accountability so that you can say this is working or this needs some adjustments? A couple things that are very important about this, this bill is it does Number one, provide transparency. So t parents can see how many dollars are attached to their individual child. They may have two kids with two different needs and subsequently two different funding streams that follow their children into the school. So there's a lot of transparency about it, but then there's an accountability piece too. And uh, the General Assembly is, has a key component to play in that oversight and accountability if we provide, if, if there is funding provided to a district, then there are metrics and measurements that have to be upheld uh, for that district, um, according to the kids that are in it. And that accountability allows us to make sure that we know where our money is being spent, we know it's how it's being spent, and we make sure that there's agreement uh, among all involved that we're spending it wisely. So where does teacher pay fit in that, that wisely formula. One of the things that has concerned me most as a Tennessee parent is um, that fewer and fewer Tennesseans are wanting to become a teacher. Yeah. And that's, I don't know if you would term that a, a crisis, but it seems it might be close. It, it, it's a crisis if you think that education is one of the most important things for the future of our state, and it is. If we don't get our public education system right, uh, then we are risking certainly the future of our state. Um, a couple things, we, I'm, I'm really pleased with the fact, we created a system in the last year that's, that it's titled Grow Your Own. It's a program that incentivizes uh, teachers. Mm -hmm. It is the first federally recognized apprenticeship program for the teaching profession. So it allows for apprenticeships in education. It, it is particularly attractive for teachers to stay, it allows them to be attracted to stay in their own district. You know, we have remarkable people across our state that are educators, and edu teachers, my, my wife is a former teacher, teachers do not, well, teachers teach because it's a calling for them. It's not just a profession. I believe that's, va that's true of the vast number of teachers in our state, we have remarkable teachers who in particular had a hard challenge the last couple of years. We need to make certain that our pay is competitive. We have increased teacher pay at a historic level since I came into office. What, what the funding formula, you asked about the funding formula and how mm -hmm. it impacts teacher pay. We had an interesting setup before where if the, if the legislature approved a teacher pay raise, it actually was there was a loophole that allowed that money to go into a school district, but it didn't necessarily have to be spent on teacher pay. Uh, we fixed that in this, we fixed that in this formula so that when we put in the budget and approve a sum of money for teacher pay raises in the state, it will go to teachers. It will go to directly to them as a pay raise and we, we, we fix that which has been a perennial problem in making sure that we uh, appropriately pay teachers. And you know what, we, we need to look at teacher pay raise, at teacher pay um, year in and year out, comparatively to other states. We wanna attract the best and brightest educators in our state, um, and pay is certainly an important part of that. 
Where is com what does competitive mean in your mind? So I think we have to look at the states around us, certainly. Yeah. That's the first place we have to look mm -hmm. because teachers are looking as well at states around them. Um, that's the first place we have to look. Okay. So um, let's put education a little bit in a bigger, broader perspective. Yeah. What is your vision for education? When you leave office, what do you want to look back and say, this is where we are? Yeah. You know, I think the purpose of education is to provide a pathway to success after the classroom. Um, the classroom is not the goal. The test score is not the goal. The academic rigor is not the goal. It is the preparation for life after the classroom. Uh, that's part of the reason that I have, you know, I worked in the HVAC and plumbing and electrical business for 35 years, and I worked around skilled tradespeople, people that are, and I know them well because I worked with them all the time, people that are gifted, people that have vocation and the ability to connect a brain to their hand that is unique to them. Um, we've done very little in our education system to reward that gifting and to provide pathways of success for life after the classroom for those students with those particular interests. Uh, when I came into office, we created the GIVE Act, the Governor's Investment Vocational Education Act, but we have relentlessly pursued what, what I started out originally saying is a plan to change the way high school looks in Tennessee. This year we approved $500 million in our budget for one-time spending that will amount to, on average, about a, th about a million dollars per high school for a CTE program and a half a million dollars for every middle school because we have to start that in middle school. I share all of that because my vision for education in Tennessee is that children of all interests, of all giftings, of all types can find a pathway through the education system that is created to give them an opportunity to live their best life, to find success after the classroom for them individually. And it may be a kid in a welding class in a rural county in 10th or 11th grade that is headed down, or it may be a kid in uh, a physics class in an urban center that plans to uh, you know, be a scientist. And we need to develop a broad array of, of, of pathways for those children. Thank you. Uh, how would you say your leadership style has evolved since you've been in office? I think, um, first of I think, all, maybe what is your leadership style? Yeah, so I think probably one of the things that I've learned most, I, I knew this when I came in, but it has evolved because it's been increasingly confirmed to me, and that is that government is not the answer to the greatest challenges of our day. Um, government, you know, the state of Tennessee government is a big enterprise. There's 40,000 employees. There's 23 division uh, uh, departments. There's, uh, we have, it's, it's a big enterprise. It's engaged in a lot of work. It's very valuable, but government is not the answer. Government can create an environment. They can provide a platform. They can provide funding. We can create uh, a vision we can impart uh, that vision to local leaders. We can engage in private sector partners and nonprofit partners and faith community partners, but we are not the answer. Government, and I say we, but government is not the answer to the challenges. The people are, and I have come to recognize that more and more and more. It's probably changed my my style, I, I, my style of leadership is to, is to function with partners. I came from the private sector. I spent 59 years of my life outside government. I've been inside, I've been engaged in government for three years. My perspective is shaped based on the vast majority of my life that realizes that uh, government has a very important role to play, but it's not to, it's not to solve the problems. What would you say your biggest failure has been so far? Yeah, I think uh, 
certainly the biggest challenge, mm -hmm. the thing that's been the most um, difficult to navigate is making decisions with very little information. Um, in COVID, for example, um, we were in a position of knowing very little about what was about to happen. A lot of conjecture, a lot of thoughts and opinions about what was going to happen, uh, but very little act, real information, very little true knowledge about what was gonna happen. And yet you had to make decisions every day that were substantive and impacted people's lives profoundly impacted their health decisions, they were livelihood decisions that impacted people's businesses and careers and their futures and their very health. And you had to make a lot of those decisions with very little information. That is, for a mechanical engineer who, who is trained <laughs> to solve problems by understanding the data and the evidence and the facts and then put those together to come up with a solution to that problem when there is no evidence and there is no facts and there is no history uh, deciding that. So my, your question was about a failure, but what, what it really was, was an enormous challenge that um, frankly, no one, could, no one could see coming. And there mm -hmm. are certainly things now in hindsight, you look back and say, well, I would have made a different decision there. I would have said something different there. But given the information you had, you were forced to make rapid decisions. And, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I think it's better to make a decision than to languish uh, for lack of information. Early in your term, you faced uh, some, uh, some fair amount of criticism for your welcoming stance toward refugees. Um, I know some people confuse refugees with immigrants. Uh, but you were pretty steadfast in your support for refugees. Yeah. Um, where are you on that question today, and where do you think the state is? Yeah. yeah you talked about the confusion. I, I, would, I would get questions about illegal immigrants and why, and, and I would remind people that we're talking about uh, legal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, legal individuals in refugees. So I worked in, I worked in a refugee camp in, uh, or had experience working in a refugee camp in the northern Uganda border and just south of Sudan. I worked in a refugee camp for ISIS refugees that were displaced in Iraq in the Kurdistan region uh, of, of Iraq and saw the conditions. I had experience with refugees and with the plight of refugees. Uh, and I recognized that America has always been and should always be a harbor for those who are um, vulnerable and are being displaced as a result mm -hmm. of horrors like ISIS or uh, the horrors of South Sudan. And it was that background and that experience that I understood that issue maybe more than Others, maybe not, they have their own understanding, but I knew what I knew about it, and I knew what I understood about it, and I knew that we could, we could do that in a way that was appropriate, and that was, that was safe, and that was vetted, and that was legal. I still believe that. I, I will always believe that. And, you know, there are times when you make decisions that may be politically unpopular or that that might go against the grain of what people around you think you ought to be doing. But uh, I, I am a person who believes that you co there's, there's certainly compromise, and in, in that's, how, that's how you navigate through difficult decisions. You make compromises, you work together with people on both sides of the aisle or in your own, in your own party. But there are those moments when you know that in your heart, uh, for you personally, someone can disagree with you, but for you personally, this is how you feel about that, and you stand firm on that, and that, that's one of those issues. Thank you. Uh, where are we now, do you think, uh, with regards to your plans to reform uh, criminal justice, particularly in light of um, what just happened in this session, uh, 
some would argue, maybe you, maybe not, uh, that those efforts have gotten a little harder, taking a step backward. Yeah. What, what do you think? Well, for me, about 20 years ago, uh, I got involved in a re-entry program. And I, I, started a pro I started going into prisons mm -hmm. and working with an organization that was re-entering men back into society after, re after uh, incarceration. I learned a lot in 20 years about the individuals who's in, uh, the differences in the individuals that are incarcerated. I also learned sort of facts and data about what happens uh, to those that are incarcerated. Different types of incarcerations for different reasons, but I learned a lot of facts, I learned a lot of evidence, I learned a lot of data. Uh, I learned that 95% of everyone in a prison gets out. They're all getting out. And 5% of them will not. They're in life sentence without parole or they're on death row. But 95% of them are gonna get out and they're gonna move into our neighborhoods. They're gonna, they're, they're all going to come back into society. I mentored men coming back um, through that entire process. And I learned that if we do that well, they will likely not go back to prison because they'll likely not recommit crimes. If we don't do that well, they will recidivate. Uh, at, the, at the rate in Tennessee of about 50% of them, within the first three years, will recommit a crime. My goal in my efforts in criminal justice reform is to lower crime. You do that by lowering recidivism. My goal is also to reduce the amount of money that we pay for these recurring criminals going back into, and we maintain them as criminals instead of reintroduce them to society as productive citizens. That costs taxpayers, it increases crime, and primarily it produces more victims. Um, if we really care about victims, we should eliminate future victims. And, and I do, and I have. And last year, I'm very pleased we passed the Alternatives to Incarceration Act. Uh, we passed the Reentry Success Act. And we made some substantive changes to our correction system and the way we work with individuals. Just yesterday, I went to a company in West Tennessee that is employed. He currently employs 22 men that are incarcerated. It's a metals, uh, a metals coating company, big manufacturing plant. He, um, he's paying them uh, half the wage of what they would normally make on the market, but they're incarcerated. They're going back into prison every night. They are thrilled, frankly, to be earning a, a, a half pay. And, and the other half that he would spend for them, it's a $15 wage or an $18 wage, whatever it is, spends half of that on the, uh, giving them a wage to allow them to pay back their fines and fees and child support, back child support. But then the other half, he invests in temporary housing, in uh, anger management classes and drug addiction classes, in he, programming for these individuals while they're on the job learning a skill in his company. It was exactly what should be happening in this state. It was a model. He has a, he has a so far, 0% recidivism rate. The amount of money that saves the state, the amount of victims that never happened, uh, the, the process there is something that I've watched, it's part of a result of our work through Department of Correction and with the Tennessee Development and Housing Agency. Uh, that partnership with local sheriff's department is working. And I talked to men yesterday and interviewed them and uh, the hope that they have and, the, and the, the commitment they have to be productive citizens is very important. We, we, we need to just continue to work on that and and we'll do so. So what do you think about the so-called Truth in Sentencing Act? Yeah, Does so it help, help us or not help you us? You know, uh, the good news about the, our legislature and, and our office is that we want the same outcome. And um, we will work together to get that same outcome. Uh, there's, different, there's differences of opinion on how that ought to be done. The particular legislation that went through, we, we worked together to find a compromise that was acceptable to both. 
uh, we will continue to work together. We want the same outcome. And I think, I think we're all committed to pursuing the evidence and the mm -hmm. approach that's gonna keep Tennesseans safe. Thank you. So you've been pretty consistent and clear uh, in your opposition to abortion. We're at a time in our country where the law of the land may be changing. Do you foresee a future in Tennessee where abortion is legal? Well, first of all, I, I, um, I do have a strongly held belief that we should protect our most vulnerable citizens. We should protect people. We should protect the lives of individuals. And that includes the lives of unborn children. I, I believe that very strongly. And I think that we, if, if you believe that, then certainly you ought to be working to make sure that, uh, that those lives are protected. But at the same time, we need to be recognized that many of these are, these are women in crisis, crisis pregnancies, um, really difficult situations in their life, unwanted pregnancies in many cases. So what, what we really ought to be doing is considering both uh, the woman that's in this situation and the child that we want to protect. It's why we've enhanced our um, funding for postpartum care for Medicaid for 10 care recipients. We have created the uh, Tennessee Fosters Hope Initiative to really expand the foster care system placements in a more productive way to improve our adoption uh, system in our state, hand in hand with that foster care system. To, we, have, we have provided funding and resources for women's health clinics that will be uh, important to women in crisis pregnancies. Uh, I think that we should do everything in our state to protect those children, but to also serve those women, and we can do both at the same time. Okay. So um, reconciling a pro-life stance with the death penalty. Your administration just recently issued a moratorium against uh, the death penalty, I think, for the rest of this year uh, for study. How do, you, how do you grapple with that question, and, and where do you stand on, on it today? Uh, that moratorium was, of course, put in place because we, we determined, we discovered that in the protocol, there is a very detailed step-by-step -step protocol that has to be adhered to uh, through an execution process. It's a very serious subject. Mm -hmm. The death penalty is, and execution is certainly of the highest level of importance, and it's incredibly important that we do that exactly as it should be done. There was a step missed in the protocol for that particular execution, which caused me to feel like I had no choice, but, and it was certainly the right choice to halt that execution, and subsequently to, to put a hold on all of them for the rest of the year, because I need to know, we need to know, Tennesseans should know that this process is being carried out uh, appropriately. So what we did, we hired an independent investigator, a former U.S. attorney, Ed Stanton, to begin this investigation to make sure that we, that we have in place a protocol that has all the checks and balances to make sure it's followed. The death penalty is reserved for the most heinous and horrific mm -hmm. of crimes, appropriately so, in my opinion. Um, I believe that. I still believe that. Uh, and certainly your, your question about the life of an innocent unborn child and the life of a heinous serial murderer, uh, those are two completely different considerations. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about um, football. Football. And the Tennessee Titans. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to ask about the balls. I mean, we're sitting right here. Yeah, so. that, that's true. Um, good question, but we'll save that for another day. So uh, a lot of folks were um, taken aback, perhaps, uh, at the state's commitment of, of public support for a private enterprise, uh, a Tennessee uh, football team. Can you explain that to us and, and how that uh, aligns with uh, conservative principles? Yeah. Uh, the state, one of the things that the state can do 
is not create jobs and not create economic activity, but we can create the environment for it. We incentivize um, private, we incentivize companies, we incentivize projects that we believe will generate economic activity and uh, tax revenue and job creation for the state. We did so with, when, when Ford Motor Company decided to move its plant into Tennessee that will ultimately probably create 30,000 jobs in, a, in that region, which is um, incredibly important to that region. But we incentivize that company with, with state dollars. And I think that's a wise investment. There will be a, a generational change in West Tennessee, and particularly in rural West Tennessee, because the opportunity that mm -hmm. will be available to so many that really was in an area that was losing population generally and had very flat economic activity. That's an investment. The, the stadium is an investment. Um, we, we said to the parties involved, which was the city and the Titans, that the state would be involved if and only if this were a roofed mm -hmm. venue. Because then it's not just about a private a company and, and football games. It's about uh, SEC championships and w winter concerts all year long and, you know, Monster Jam and uh, the Super Bowl. And it's about a world-class venue that is appropriate for a world-class city. Um, tourism is the number two economic driver in the state of Tennessee. We have tourism assets from Mountain City to Memphis, remarkable assets. People, people come here in record numbers to see the things that are unique about our state. Mm -hmm. Investing in tourism and investing in economic activity for a region uh, that will be a return for, for our state is a calculation and an investment that I think is well worth it. Very good. Uh, a couple years ago, you signed a bill, uh, what we would call an anti-slap uh, bill. And um, for, for those of us in media, we talk about um, strategic lawsuits against public participation, as they're known a lot. And that's when uh, people who have a lot of money will file frivolous lawsuits against uh, small newspapers, say, who don't have a lot of money to defend themselves, or private citizens uh, who don't have money either. Uh, for expensive legal defense uh, as a way of stifling um, their actions. And you signed a, a bill against that. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about that decision, but also transparency, government transparency in particular, which is something you spoke about when you first ran for governor. Yeah. Um, I, I, I need to go back and read. It's been a few years. I'd have to read the details of that piece of legislation. But, but I, I'll just say broadly that um, without a free press and the free expression of ideas and the ability for, um, for that important First Amendment speech protection uh, to be provided through the press, without that we, we can't have a free country. We we should let people express their ideas and then we should let the public decide if those ideas are mm -hmm. good ones or not. Um, we certainly should not censor. And we should certainly should not, either in the private sector or in the, in the government sector, um, we need to maintain and protect that. And, and, and transparency as well. I, Speaker Sexton passed a, a, a brought forth and we signed and the legislature work together to create a transparency bill that provided for greater transparency in uh, organizations in particular that are lobbying government. I, I do believe that transparency is important. I do believe that being able to, to know information that's appropriate. And, we all know there are there is information that isn't appropriate to be transparent. There's mm -hmm. protections that have to be uh, afforded 
but and determining what's right, where, where that transparency is right and wrong is very important. So uh, your administration uh, sometimes cites a legal precept known as deliberative privilege. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that yeah. a little bit? That'd be the, that would be an example uh, where you should appropriately protect a deliberation, for example, uh, before a decision is made that makes certain that the de decision can be made with, uh, without pressure from the outside. Um, it's, it's been used because it's appropriately used. And I, I think, it, for example, we, we see what happened at the Supreme Court when a privileged and protected deliberation was thwarted in this brief leak in the last several weeks, a, a, a real breach of, and tra tragic in my view, of an institution who relies on that ability to deliberate privately and with privilege before the decisions are made and delivered to the public. That That's very important in this country in certain circumstances, and, and we need to recognize it and understand it. Very good. So last question. I asked you about what you thought might be your biggest failure. What, what do you think is your biggest success so far? Uh, my wife and I were actually talking about this the other night. Um, you know, when I ran for office, I'd never run for office. I'd never been uh, involved in politics much. but. I had, I had lived enough life and had enough experiences and some of them I've shared with, you know, mentoring kids or being involved in the ag business and growing up in, 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 in agriculture or skilled trades, and mentoring men in prison. I had enough experiences and subsequent interactions with government of that experience that I, I really believed that what people expected from government was pretty simple. Um, I, part of my part of my talking, you know, part of what I said when I r ran around the state was, I, I really think it's pretty simple. People want a good job and a good school for their kid in a safe neighborhood. That's that's really what all Tennesseans would like to have. We have wholeheartedly focused on economic development that provides opportunity for Tennesseans. We've, we've, we've brought, uh, I believe 70,000 jobs have come into the state since 2019, but more importantly, we are, because of my experience in skilled trade, we are equipping young people to be able to find meaningful, dignified employment with regardless of the skill set and the giftings that they have. Are we there yet? No, but we are well on our way to creating opportunity for more and more and more Tennesseans. Um, people want a good school for their kid. We just made the most historic investment in restructuring that historic investment in our public school system. Uh, we have worked to provide choice for parents in, in, in education in this state that's specifically targeted at the most underserved kids in our state. We're not there yet, but we are well on our way to providing more and more access to kids having a good school. And everyone doesn't live in a safe neighborhood, but we have invested through not only criminal justice reform, which at its core is about a reduction in crime. That is, the, that is at the core of criminal justice reform. In my, in my heart, in my view, and the reason I'm after it, but we've also recognized that the rule of law is really important in our state, and we've, um, we've invested in, in law enforcement. I rode around with the chief of police in, in Memphis and said, what do you need more of? What can we do to help? What would prevent, what would really lower the crime rate in Memphis? And she said, more officers. And I had an experience this week, yesterday. So we have cadet classes of, of, of highway patrolmen. And once during their 12 weeks of cadet class, I meet them at 4.50 a.m. and work out with all of them. These are guys, that, they're, they're, they're men and women that are about to graduate 
as cadets, they're about to be highway patrolmen. Uh, and so I go and we do their PT with them in the morning and then have breakfast and, and I travel from table to table and I talk to them. Why, why did you want to be a trooper? Why do you want to be in law enforcement? What got you here? And you know, we did this video in the fall about, hey, if you're a highway, if you're a police officer in California to New York, we, we want you in Tennessee. We believe in you, we respect you, we invest in you. And so this guy sitting across the table from me said, well, I'm from Baltimore City. And I said, what, what are you, uh, or Baltimore County, not, he, there is Baltimore City there, but he was in Baltimore County Sheriff's Department. And I said, well, what brought you here? And he said, well, I'm from Texas, and I, my wife, but my wife said she wouldn't move to Texas for whatever reason. And he said, and I saw your video on Facebook, and I said, we should go to Tennessee. I said, you moved here to be a highway patrolman from Baltimore County because you saw that video. And he said, yeah, but it's not just a video. He said, uh, I believe that this state has a respect for an investment and, 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 a, and an appreciation value for law enforcement. We do. We're making historic investments there. We're, we're create, we have funded, uh, we're funding a, the largest ever and first class training facility for our law enforcement uh, officers, not just troopers, but other agencies as well, uh, that will be completed in uh, three or four years. And it'll be world class because we should have world class law enforcement training modernized training that recognizes how law enforcement interacts with the community in an appropriate way. Policing a community and the involvement with them is incredibly important to having, uh, to having good relationships and to having a, the lowering of crime. So I, I, I had not talked about that much today. It's important to me. The success for me is that I, five years ago, I, I said people want a good school, a good job in a safe neighborhood and I've spent the vast majority of the four years I've been in three and a half years I've been in office so far working on those things well thank you very much Governor Lee you, and sir. on behalf of the USA Today Network in Tennessee and the Knoxville News Sentinel I thank all of you for joining us here today at the University of Tennessee Knoxville GBO thank you thank you Thank you, sir. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. Let's try this again. Now we have some sound. Good evening. I'm Randy Boyd, the president of the University of Tennessee System. And I want to thank the USA Today Network for sponsoring this tonight. I also want to thank uh, the University of Tennessee Knoxville for um, hosting us at this event. I want to thank our candidates for putting themselves out there. And in particular, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. We need more of you. We need more people to be engaged in the civic process. And uh, events like this is one way in which we can do that. Let's get started. Oh, we're running a bit late, so we'll go ahead and get started. And I want to introduce to you the candidates that are going to be um, presented to you tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to bring out Dr. Jason Martin. Dr. Jason Martin was raised and educated in Alabama. He is a physician and a business owner. He's worked at Vanderbilt and Meharry Medical College, training physicians, and is a health care advocate. And next, I'd like to bring out J.B. Smiley. J.B. Spiley is a native Memphian, collegiate and semi-professional basketball player, a University of Arkansas graduate. He is an attorney and was elected to the Memphis City Council in 2019. A couple of housekeeping rules, gentlemen. Uh, I have a colleague in front that has a timer. When she shows you a yellow light, that means you have 15 seconds left to answer. And when you see the red light, you'll need to stop. Um, and with that, I'd like to s begin by asking each of you to give a 90-second introduction. And we'll start uh, with Mr. Martin. All right. 
Dr. Martin. Good evening. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, in case uh, we haven't met, my name is Jason Martin, and I'm a husband, uh, a father, a critical care doctor, a proud Democrat, and a candidate for governor. Um, you may have heard I was raised in L.A., lower Alabama, uh, but I moved up to Tennessee about 20 years ago to do my medical training at uh, Vanderbilt. I was raised by working class folks in a working class neighborhood, and my parents instilled in me the values of hard work, faith, family, and community. And I'm proud to have said that I brought those values up to Tennessee in my medical practice, and I've had a chance to serve at the Nashville VA Hospital, the Nashville General Hospital. I taught at Meharry Medical College, and uh, most recently I've been working up in the rural community, communities of Sumner County uh, doing critical care medicine. And I think that has informed my politics quite a bit because when you're talking to patients in the ICU, you're meeting them at their most vulnerable, learning about their lives, you learn a lot about how Governor Bill Lee's policies have failed us. And I'm not just talking about health care. People talk about the crumbling bridges. They talk about lack of access to health care in the communities where, we, where they live. They talk about lack of access to broadband. You know, all that into account, for me, the straw that broke the camel's back was dealing with the COVID crisis and seeing hundreds and hundreds of my patients die and never having that loss met with any leadership by Governor Bill Lee's administration. So I'm here tonight to offer a positive vision for Tennessee, a positive alternative, and check out our website. That's where you'll find our prescription for Tennessee. Thank you. Mr. Smiley. Good evening. Thank you all for having me. There we go. Good evening. Thank you all for having me. I am Councilman J.B. Smiley, Jr. And I'm running for governor because we deserve a better Tennessee. Currently, we're number one in medical bankruptcies. We have the third highest violent crime rate, and we are the fourth lowest in median income in the country. Tennessee deserves a governor who is competent, but also someone who understands what it's like to struggle in Tennessee. I spent the summers of my youth in the poor zip code of this state. And when it was time for me to go to school, I had to go across town to get a good education. What I've learned from my experiences and my travels across this state is that families all want the same thing. Parents want to send their children to a school that's fully funded and high performing. And when they go to work, they want to make a living wage so they're not simply paying bill after bill, but have an opportunity to save. And if they get sick, they don't want to drive 30 miles down the road. They want to go to a hospital in their community. And they all understand that women are entitled to respect and deserve the ability to make decisions regarding their body. We can create this Tennessee, a better Tennessee together. I am Councilman J.B. Smiley, Jr., and it will be the honor of my lifetime to serve you all as your next governor. Thank you so much. Well, thank you both. We have some uh, questions that have been submitted by the Tennessean and for people all across the state. And I'd like to ask, begin by asking each of you a question. I'll start with you. Uh, Mr. Smiley, and then we'll have the same question for you, Dr. Martin. Um, the first question is this. The Tennessee State Legislature and Governor Lee just passed the Tennessee Investment and in Student Achievement, or TISA, Act this year to reform student finance. If elected governor, how would you approach TISA, and what changes might you make? Well, um, what I do understand to be true the current administration invested a billion dollars extra into the uh, current education formula. But what we know to be true, that billion dollars is simply not enough. With that billion dollars, we're still among the lowest funded uh, states when it comes to education. How would I approach it? I'm going to give the schools exactly what they need, which is more dollars. We're going to make sure that teachers are fully funded, make sure teachers are paid a salary commensurate with their worth. That's what I would do as governor. Thank you. Dr. Martin? Well, the reason we're talking about TISA at all, the reason that we're talking about TISA at all is because we have neglected public education in this state for years. I mean, for decades, it's been allowed to wither on the vine. We've been 46th in the nation when it comes to funding our public schools. We had 11,000 unfunded teacher positions in the state of Tennessee. And so the question is, does TISA solve the problems that have been present in public education? And, and I don't think it does. Um, I, I think that it is more the same uh, when it comes uh, to Governor Bill Lee's uh, attack on public education. He, he's trying to rob communities of local control with TISA. Uh, he is prioritizing uh, ideologically based charter schools 
which have been a failed experiment in the state of Tennessee over traditional public education. Um, and I think that, you know, he's had continued attacks against public education by politicizing school boards. So TISA is not the answer. What we need to do uh, is to focus on supporting our teachers, fully funding our public schools, and keeping them public. Th thank you both for those answers. Now we're going to change topics and talk about economic development. And uh, this time, uh, Dr. Martin, we'll start with you. Same question for each of you. Economic development from investment in bringing a Ford plant to West Tennessee to offering support for a new Tennessee Titan Stadium have both been praised and criticized. How would you approach economic development investments in the state of Tennessee? Yeah, great question. Okay. So economic development uh, has not been equal across the state. I mean, I live in Nashville, and I can look out my window and see a dozen tea cranes in the distance. But what uh, I've learned from visiting rural Tennessee on the 95-county tour and talking to thousands of Tennesseans where they are is that the economic prosperity is not fairly distributed. So what we need to do is focus on education, which not only includes K through 12, but also great vocational training. We need access to health care. Health care is so important. Who wants to go set up shop or build a new factory or bring a business to town when there's no access to health care? We need Medicaid expansion to shore that up. And we need great infrastructure, including broadband internet, which is a utility in the state of Tennessee now, basically, for businesses. They need to have it to survive. So we need education, health care, and broadband internet and other infrastructure in place to create economic prosperity. Thank you, Mr. Smiley. Well, I think the key term for us all to learn is uh, equitable distribution of resources. When we talk about economic development, for some reason, economic development only seems to go to the downtowns and, and some of the larger cities. When I go to uh, rural Tennessee, I see no economic development. What I know to be true is the governor is the chief ambassador for all of Tennessee. We need to place an emphasis not only on the urban centers, but rural Tennessee as well, because they deserve uh, economic development in their communities as well. We need to be fostering relationships with businesses across this country to bring them into rural Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you. This time, uh, Mr. Smiley, we'll start with you. Both of you, again, get the same question. You may have heard the governor just passed uh, uh, or signed a new bill called the Institute for American Civics, which is going to be housed at the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville through the Baker Center. And its mission is to help promote civil discourse and civic engagement. I was just told the other day that at our primary election in Knox County, only 8% of the registered voters turned out to vote. And I don't think Knox County is uh, exceptional in, across the state. So my question to you is, what role do you think elected officials have in increasing civic engagement amongst all Tennesseans? Elected officials have a absolute duty to do everything they can, but our current administration is simply not doing it. Tennessee ranks among the worst in voter turnout, among the worst in voter participation. Why? Because the current administration has made it its mission for people not to go to the polls. And we talk about civil discourse. This current administration is banning books. This current administration does not want us to talk about any difficult subjects in the classroom. So we should be uh, placing an affirmative duty on the elected officials to get people out to vote and learn about civil discourse. But this administration has simply dropped the ball. We can do better. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martin. Yeah, I don't think that uh, civil discourse is only going to improve uh, through, uh, through the classroom. I think what we need to do is get people out to vote, and that means we need to address our really aggressive uh, uh, voting laws, which suppress the vote, in my opinion. We need to do things uh, like uh, uh, address our aggressive voter purging uh, processes. We need to create convenience voting centers so that it's easier for folks to vote, not just at uh, their precinct, but anywhere they happen to be close to on voting day. Um, uh, we need to uh, address the fact that 8% of the population in Tennessee, more than 400,000 Tennesseans have been disenfranchised because of a legal infraction. And we need to make it easier uh, for nonviolent offenders to have a pathway back to the voting booth so we can increase, increase civic engagement. And let me tell you one other thing. Information is power. Information more and more these days comes via broadband, so I take this back to infrastructure. We need infrastructure and broadband in rural Tennessee so they can have the information they need to make informed decisions. Great. Thank you both. Let's change our subject to uh, health care. I was uh, fortunate to be at uh, six graduation ceremonies at the UT Health Science Center in your hometown of Memphis Absolutely. the other day. One of the things I'm incredibly proud of at the UT Health Science Center is their focus on addressing health equity gaps. And so I'm curious of each of you what your thoughts are around how the state can help address those health equity gaps. 
And I'll start with you, Dr. Martin. Sure. Well, uh, in my role as uh, a physician in public health, I have lived and watched people make decisions about life and death based purely on finances. I've had people choose death over bankruptcy, and that's heartbreaking. It shouldn't happen in Tennessee. We're number one in the nation when it comes to medical bankruptcies, number one in the nation when it comes to hospital closures per capita. Both of those disproportionately affect rural Tennessee. The easiest, quickest solution is to subscribe to Medicaid expansion now. We are missing out on a billion dollars a year, a billion dollars that are our tax dollars the federal government is trying to give back to us, and we're turning, our, turning it away. And uh, if it's been shown from the 30-odd states, 37 other states who are participating in Medicaid expansion, that health equity gaps decrease dramatically when you expand Medicaid. We could expand 400,000 more Tennesseans with signatures tomorrow if Governor Bill Lee and the radical supermajority had the political courage to make it so. Great. Thank you. Well, Dr. Martin is absolutely right. We need to be expanding Medicaid, but it doesn't stop there. So I grew up in... Memphis, Tennessee, a uh, large part of our population lives in poverty. And what I learned growing up is my neighbors had to walk to the corner store to get their groceries. But when they walked to the corner store, there was no full service grocery store around. How do we address health equity? We need to be using some of those surplus dollars to implement or put in place full service grocery stores in the food deserts across the state. Health equity doesn't just stop or start with expanding Medicaid. We need to invest in people, invest in communities who are suffering and are neglected. Great. Th thank you both. I'm going to uh, change subjects now to higher education and access to higher education. You're probably aware that we have thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of undocumented people in the state of Tennessee that the state provides opportunities for them to go for, through K through 12. However, when they graduate from high school, to go to any of our higher education institutions, they have to pay out-of-state tuition, which is sometimes triple the in-state tuition. I'm curious about your thoughts on how to provide access or not to those, those students in our state. And I'll start with Mr. Smiley. What I understand to be true is children who live in Tennessee, young people who live in Tennessee, they should be our responsibility. We shouldn't be spending our time breaking up homes or trying to make life difficult for, for them. We should be putting them in a better position to succeed because their success is the state of Tennessee's success. And what we should be doing to give them an opportunity to go to higher education, we need to make, make sure that those costs are affordable. They shouldn't be required to pay out-of-state taxes or out-of-state costs like they are not a part of Tennessee. They're us, and what people in Tennessee understand is Strong, we are stronger together, and diversity makes us better. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Martin. Yeah. So, you know, I believe that regardless of your zip code, no matter the color of your skin, the language you speak, who you choose to love, Tennessee should be the land of opportunity for you. We have a lot of folks uh, in the immigrant community uh, in this state who are working and contributing and paying taxes, and we should support them as their families grow, and we absolutely should uh, support them with higher education benefits as well. They're earning them. They're out there working hard, just like we are. Great, thank you. So we have a little change of tack. These are a bit easier, I think, but we're <laughs> going to ask uh, some questions for the audience to be able to get to know you a little bit better. Great. So the first question will be, and I'll start with you, Dr. Martin. Um, so how do you how do you approach and explain tough decisions that might be unpopular uh, and open to criticism? Uh, well, uh, thanks for that question. So um, uh, being a leader is not always just blowing with the political winds. Unfortunately, that's what we've seen with, with Governor Bill Lee. I mean, I think back to COVID, when we you know, were seeing hundreds and thousands of Tennesseans die, and there was never any leadership from Governor Lee in that moment. There was never anyone there to make difficult decisions on our behalf. And the fend for yourself approach yielded the results you might expect. More than 25,000 Tennesseans have died. So I think what you have to do is um, make the tough calls, be truthful with folks. Be transparent about the data you're using to make decisions. Be transparent about why you're making the calls that you're making, and stick to it. Great. Thank you. Mr. Smiley. Leadership is not easy. Leadership is something that you have to make very difficult decisions. This current administration had a very difficult decision to make. Well, it wasn't that difficult at all when the homelessness bill came across the governor's desk. He didn't do the right thing or 
reflect any type of courage by vetoing their bill. He's simply allowed to go into law. What we need in our leadership, what we need in our future leaders, our future governors, someone who understands what needs to be done in this state. We need courage, we need bold leadership, and how I handle it, I directly address it. We speak truth to power, we implement policies to put people in a better position, and we do everything we can to remember the role of government, which is to provide for the general welfare of its people. And if it's not doing that, we push back against it. Great. Here's a fun question. I'd be eager to hear your answers to this one. So as you might know, I'm a former and recovering candidate myself. There's a <laughs> lot of things that are uh, challenging about a campaign, but one of the best parts is just getting to know your state. You go to every nook and cranny in every corner of the state and get to see fascinating people and fascinating places. So my question to you is, can you name two of the places that you've been, either a favorite diner or a community event or something that you discovered in the state that you'd want to share with everyone else? And I'll start with uh, Mr. Smiley. Well, uh, I think, you know, for me, one of the, uh, my favorite moments was a visit to Benton County. I met a lot of people eager to learn about our campaign. There was a particular lady that I met that day. Uh, I said something um, that there simply wasn't right. I said, being poor in Memphis is just like being poor in Benton County. She pulled me aside, and everybody was happy to hear me. She pulled me aside, well, Councilman Smiley, could you come here? And I said, yes, ma'am. And I just knew she was going to tell me how great I was. She said, well, being poor in Memphis is not the same. She told me that if you're poor in rural Tennessee, you can't walk to the corner store. You have to get in your car and drive five miles. So I talk about that experience to, to say that, you know, I love learning. And she educated me that day. And uh, most recently, I had an opportunity to go to Loudoun County and Blount County, particularly in Blount County, I had an opportunity to eat in a restaurant. And it was amazing. There was a lot of people engaged. And I actually sat down, and uh, the gentleman on the stage was playing the guitar, and I got some pretty good music. Great, thank you. Dr. Martin. Yeah, um, so uh, in terms of restaurants, the, the campaign has been really bad for my health. Uh, we're on the road a lot, and I think I've gained about 10 pounds eating such good food across the state. I can't pick one. I do want to tell you a story, though, about Lake County, Tennessee. Uh, I went to Lake County. It's up in northwest Tennessee, basically southern Missouri, 120,000 acre county, 80,000 80, of which are cultivated. As we're driving up to meet with the mayor of Lake County, I'm seeing solar panels dotting the barns. And I was surprised by that, it seemed out of place. So he told me, yeah, we were able to get a grant for these barns to get uh, solar power, and now the panels are paying for themselves in three years, and the farmers are super excited about solar. So the next step, the community went out and they bought you know, several thousand acres, and on that acreage, they had a, a company come in and install a power plant scale solar installation. So now the company's making money selling solar power to the TVA. The, the uh, community was able to take the property tax revenue from that installation and build a new high school with cash. And in that high school, they've got job training programs to teach the kids how to go out and manage the solar farm. That, ladies and gentlemen, is leadership. Thank, thank you. So I'll start with you, Dr. Martin. Name a person who has had deep influence on your life, and what's one lesson you could share with the audience from that person's um, influence on you. My grandmother, I know she's watching. Uh, May May, I love you. She's been a role model for me. Um, she lost her husband at an early age, a single woman in the 70s. Not an easy time with two high school children to go, uh, go to work and get your first job, but she did it. She raised her family. She became successful in business. She worked for GAF and sold shingles. Talk about a man's business. But she was wildly successful at it. And I'm so proud of her for um, you know, breaking the, the glass ceiling of women in the workplace in the 70s. I'm so proud of what she taught me about overcoming obstacles and stick to itiveness. Love you, May. Mr. Martin. I mean, for Mr. those Martin. of you who know me, I spend a lot of time sharing stories about my father. Um, my father grew up on H.M. Haney's plantation in Jonestown, Mississippi. Um, he grew up extremely poor. He walked to school sometimes with holes in his shoes. Um, he didn't have an opportunity to use an indoor restroom until he turned 18. And at some point, he met a lovely lady by the name of Jackie Davis, and he found his way to Memphis. Um, particularly, my father would have so many different lessons. As a young person, you know you're always going to push back. Two things that he taught me that stick with me every day. Never forget the bridge that brought you over. What he was telling me at that point in time is always remember where you started. Never forget. And the second lesson that he shared with me was service 
before self. What he was telling me then and what he's still telling me now, although he's you know, not doing so well health-wise, it's always about the people. What are you doing for someone else? Great, thank you. So the moment you've been waiting for, this is the close. <laughs> Each of you are gonna get 90 seconds to share with the audience your closing statement. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Mr. Smiley. <clears throat> On April 5th, I drove about seven miles to the VA hospital. I went up to the second floor, I went to room 228, and I sat in the chair. In the hospital bed next to me was the gentleman who also shares my name, J.B. Smiley Sr. And I asked him how he was doing. He quickly pushed back on me. He said, what are you doing here? Just know your old man is going to be OK. As long as you are out there fighting for us all, I'm going to fight to be here, because I truly want to see a better Tennessee. What I learned from that conversation with my father on April 5th is we must fight for what we want. If we want a state in which we have a living wage, if we want a state in which women are treated fairly, we want a state in which the right to choose is written to a law, if we want a state in which our seniors can retire with dignity, if we want a state in which we are affirming those individuals, no matter how they identify or who they love, we must fight. Bill Lee's administration does not support our values, nor should they represent us. Tennesseans understand that we are stronger together, and diversity makes us better. I am J.B. Smiley, Jr., and I can assure you one thing. I will fight for you, and I will fight for a better Tennessee. I ask for your prayers and your vote. Visit votejbsmiley.com. Thank you all. Dr. Martin. Yeah, thank you all so much uh, for the forum tonight. Thank you so much for the chance to be here and share a positive vision uh, for the state of Tennessee. I was really glad to see Governor Lee here tonight. I wish he had been up on stage with us so we could engage with him uh, and, and, and talk with him. Yeah. I think that as I use my physician's lens and I look across the state of Tennessee, Tennessee has an affliction and the affliction is a lack of leadership. And what we saw tonight with Governor Lee, with his uh, uh, unwillingness to interact with us, participate and collaborate, I think is indicative of his leadership style, which has been top down, not conversational, not collaborative, working with a radical general assembly that doesn't seek input from the other side. And look, I have to tell you, as a Tennessean, as an American, I think that the team sport mentality to Politics is breaking us and tearing us apart. I really want to come together, turn down the volume, and find solutions to our problems together. And so that's why I've posted a prescription for Tennessee online. It's our policy platform. It's martin4tn.com, martin4tn.com. Check out our issues. We would love the chance to earn your support. Thank you. Mr. Smiley, Dr. Martin, thank you so much for participating in the forum tonight. Thank you. Thank Good you. Luck. Next time we go to the board. Forum to another part of our uh, the, the election cycle this year, and that is to discuss um, or have a discussion with some of our congressional delegates that are running to, uh, this year. So I'd like to bring to the stage first Cameron Parsons. Cameron Parsons is the Democratic candidate for the U.S. House District 1. He is a Kingsport resident with degrees in history and biology. Now I'd like to invite Mark Harmon to the stage. Mark Harmon is a Democratic candidate for the U.S. House District 2. He is a journalism and broadcast professor at the University of Tennessee and served as Knox County Commissioner from 2006 to 2010. Welcome, gentlemen. So you may have heard the instructions for, with the previous uh, candidates, but the instructions are you're going to get an uh, opportunity to give a 90-second uh, uh, opening uh, remarks, and you'll have 60 seconds to respond to all the questions that we'll have. Each of you will get a chance to answer each of the same questions. And we have a colleague in the front that has a yellow light that gives you the 15-second warning, and then a red light, which means you have to stop. And so with that, I'd like to start with Mr. Harmon at giving your opening comments. Thank you. I'm Mark Harmon. I'm running for Congress. 
against failed insurrectionist Tim Burchett. And um, I'm not the NCIS guy. But what I want to start with is something that might be a little bit surprising. I want to talk directly, not just to the audience, but also to the folks out there, to people who may have previously voted for Tim Burchett. People are beginning to have second th thoughts, and they should have those second thoughts. Not only did he vote with the insurrectionists, and if he had his way, the peaceful transfer of power would have been delayed or denied, he also voted against a bipartisan infrastructure bill that cost Tennessee about a billion and a half dollars if he had had his way. Not coming here. Bad roads. And then, to cap it all off, this past week he voted against aid to Ukraine. And he voted against twice against our NATO allies, against extending the Violence Against Women Act, against the Act Against Asian Hate Crimes. He just doesn't seem to get it. He's getting worse. Tim Burchett went to Congress, and a lot of people had hopes. But really, he went to the swamp and became just another swamp creature. I want to be something different. I can tell you later in the debate about my time as a county commissioner. Some of you know that. But I want to be that, right, that light of hope that says we can do better, we can care about it. Tim Burchett wants to be the Twitter critic of Congress. I want to be your congressman. Thank you. Mr. Parsons. Uh, <clears throat> hello, uh, I'm Cameron Parsons. I'm the candidate for Tennessee's first congressional district. Uh, it seems we have a lot in common as terms of opponent. Uh, they both have voted against the interests of people in Tennessee and across the country, uh, aid to Ukraine, uh, prescription drug prices. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And the more you know about people like this who raise insane amounts of money to run and win with virtually no opposition from anybody, they buy their way through everything. It's, there has to be a change, and it has to start here with people like you. We all have to get out and vote and vote for candidates that are going to look after your interest, the interests of people of Tennessee, the, people, the interests of people across the country. There's so much more that we can be doing to help people in need, and we are just not doing it. And it, it just seems crazy to me that no one else is stepping up to, to push these people to do better. And I'm very happy to be here to talk to you all, and uh, we can discuss more about what, how we're going to make those positive changes and help everyone here. So thank you. Great. Thank you, thank you both. So the first question is, what are the most important issues you're hearing from constituents that they wanted addressed in Washington, D.C.? And uh, Mr. Harmon, we'll start, actually, Mr. Parsons, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, one of my main priorities is uh, reforming our election system. Uh, like the candidates here before, there have been efforts all across the country to suppress the vote. They are, uh, the minority has taken over, and our voices are not being heard across the country. One of the best things we can do is put term limits on people who run for office so that they can't just continue to enact these bad policies against the wishes of everyday citizens. Uh, we can reform our campaign finance laws so that you don't just have to have a million dollars and automatically get elected in any office or district. Uh, um, so I think starting there with election reform is one of the big things I'm hearing. People just want their votes to be counted. And every person that is able to vote legally should be able to cast that vote. Dr. Herman. Uh, well, Cameron's right. Uh, corruption is a big issue. Let's call it what it is, corruption. Now, I don't think your congressmen are bought and paid for, but I think there are far too many who can be rented. And uh, that's what we're seeing a lot now with our campaign finance system. But on top of that, I want to add another issue. Women across America are furious. They're about to lose a constitutional right to a Supreme Court that doesn't get it. To four of the five people who don't have uteruses telling women what they need to do in problem pregnancies or pregnancies that are going to disrupt their families. It is wrong. It is outrageous. And to make it even worse, Tim Burchett joined that terrible Mississippi lawsuit on behalf, a friend of the court brief, on behalf of the awful 
Mississippi law. That's, that hasn't got enough publicity. He's on the wrong side of this, and the um, Tennessee women need better congressmen. You can have both of us, by the way. We're running in different districts. <laughs> So let's turn our attention to the economy for a moment. Americans are facing record high inflation, and while the economy is doing well in terms of unemployment rate and growth, many Americans are feeling hurt by gas and grocery prices. If elected, what will you do to help the average American? We'll start with uh, you, Ms. Uh, uh, Mr. Parsons. Sure. Um, so I think there is not just one answer to fixing this. Uh, the biggest source of our inflation issue has come around energy, fuel prices, things like that. We have got to do a much better job of not only reducing carbon emissions, but allowing people that need to have the low gasoline prices to get that. And that is including, um, you know, uh, increasing our <clears throat> oil production here where we need it and not just doing that but also investing in clean energy at the same time because we can't just go down the path of electric cars to fix everything a lot of people can't afford that and we're going to have to do more than just invest in these smart technologies and unfortunately some of that might be dirty sources of energy but that's something we are just going to have to go all in i mean people need help in any way they can get it and i don't feel like we can pull back from that anytime soon. Dr. Harmon. We are facing a global inflation issue because of the end of the pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But those things are largely beyond our control in the federal government. What I want to do, when I pull off this upset win, I want to be the great advocate for the antitrust division of the Justice Department. We should be prosecuting a heck of a lot more corporations for price fixing and price gouging, and we should be taking away their corporate welfare. Because as we look out this, this, this week, we've seen huge corporate profits on the back of our inflated prices. We've seen them doing stock buybacks rather than helping the average worker and the average American. And we have seen too much corporate corruption in our system. I will be that advocate who will say, we need to take seriously the fact that we have mega corporations that are too big and no longer competitive. Thank you. So let's turn to international affairs now for a moment. Your opponents recently voted against additional aid to Ukraine in the Russian invasion. What would your approach have been? And we'll start, I think, with you, Dr. Harmon. Well, first, I would have voted for the aid. <laughs> and on top of that, you may not know that Tim Burchett has voted twice against symbolic resolutions supporting our NATO allies. I believe in NATO. NATO has been a bulwark against communist expansion and against autocracies and Russian fascism. Let's face it, call it what it is. I would support NATO. I would support it strongly. I would support aid to Ukraine. And I think the current administration is doing a good balance in terms of keep keeping the allies together. And as Finland and Sweden come up for NATO membership, I will support that too. Mr. Parsons? Uh, I absolutely agree. Uh, this country used to be called the arsenal of democracy for a good reason. Uh, we support free people across the world, uh, and Ukraine is no different. They've been attacked by an authoritarian government uh, under false pretenses, and they need our help. And there is no excuse for us to not supply material needs to uh, people who want to be free. And NATO has been that main opponent for these uh, authoritarians across the world, and we have to continue that support. There is no other country that can do what we do. We have some of the greatest minds in the world. We have some of the greatest equipment capabilities in the world, and our power is second to none. And we have to do that to support free people around the world, protect them from those evil governments. Great. Thank you both. So I'm going to combine two questions. I'm not sure if that's allowed, but I think I'm, I'm going to take that privilege because I think they're kind of both related. Uh, you're both facing, or you're both challenging incumbents. Hmm. How will you persuade citizens of your district that are 
that you're a better alternative. And I'll tie that into another question that's very similar, and that is, uh, how do you address the citizens who think that Democrats have veered too far to the left? Basically, what's your strategy to win? And we'll start with you, Mr. Mm, uh, sure. Parsons. Uh, actually, I've been really surprised with the number of people I talk to and say, well, I used to be a Democrat, but, uh, and a lot of those issues are, you know, abortion is one of them, guns are another, um, and uh, abortion has been in the news recently uh, for all the wrong reasons. Uh, stripping a woman's right to choose is not the direction this country needs to be going in. And to counter that, what I tell people is we are not doing anything to protect women who are pregnant. The United States has one of the worst records for women dying during childbirth. Children are going hungry. There, uh, right now there is a shortage of formula for children. I mean, we are not doing enough on the other end. Republicans say they care about the unborn fetus, but once it's born, they give up on it and they don't care. We have got to do more to help women, help children, and just banning abortion is not a solution. Thank you, and Dr. Harmon. Yes. This election isn't about right and left. It's about right and wrong. It's wrong to vote with insurrectionists and delay the peaceful transfer of power. It's wrong to not represent your district's needs when it comes to infrastructure. It's wrong to take away women's rights. And it's wrong when Tim Burchett, shortly after Congress got a briefing on the forthcoming pandemic, sold a whole bunch of Denny stock. You know, this is the kind of everyday corruption that makes people turn off and say, I don't trust any of them. Well, look at me. Former county commissioner, managed to work with Republicans. Heck, I worked with Lumpy Lambert, for God's sake. All right? I can work across the aisle, and I can be that voice of honesty who worked with neighborhood associations against rogue developers and for people who were suffering and not those who were making them suffer. Speaking of working in Congress, one of the things that you'll have the opportunity to do is serve in a committee. Now, I know there will be a lot of other people that have decisions on which committees that you get to serve in, but if you get to choose, which committees would you most uh, want to serve in and why? And we'll start with you, Dr. Harmon. This may please you as a university president and as my tentative, I, my boss, really. Exactly. <laughs> um, I want to be on the Education Committee. And more important than being on the Education Committee, I want to work through it to champion legislation for more grants for college students, okay? Uh, too many of them are heavily reliant on loans. I want grants to increase so there be fewer loans because the debt college students are graduating with is just untenable. It's gonna ruin our economy, it's gonna ruin education, it's gonna ruin people's lives. We need to change that and I wanna champion that. I also believe in a certain amount of loan forgiveness, probably around $50,000 uh, cap, capped around 10,000, 100,000 in yearly income because that will get the most social mobility. I've actually read research on this stuff, folks. I want to be an advocate in the Education Committee for specifically helping people get post-secondary and collegiate grants. Mr. Carson. Um, <clears throat> one of my passions is around budgets. Um, so I really think that this country has to have a balanced budget. There is no reason for us to pass a deficit every single year. And that is one of the things I would love to get to work on is not canceling investments in our future. There are things that we can do, like investments in infrastructure that pay for themselves over time. But the money that we have wasted in places like Afghanistan is it, staggering. In the trillions of dollars, money that could have gone to help people here is just, it's lost. And that's because people did not budget correctly for it and gave it away. Uh, so for me, that is something that I think we have to solve, and that is something I'd like to work on. Great. Thank you. So we've got a fun question, a personal question, and then your close. So the fun question, you've been traveling around your districts. I know both of your districts quite well, and there's lots of fascinating people, restaurants, things to see and do. 
So as a travel guide or as a, someone who wants to give a, share a, a personal story about an experience you've had, could you share one experience that you've had in your district during this campaign? We'll start with you, uh, Mr. Parsons. Mm, sure. Hmm. Well, I also have been eating a lot of good food. Uh, hmm. It's hard to pick just one. Uh, I mean, for me, it's so surprising to see such a diverse group of people and how they all basically want the same things. Uh, like they said before, people want to have a good job, people want to have a good school and a safe community. And it doesn't matter what you look like or where you come from, that's what people desire to have. And it doesn't matter if I talk to someone old or young or whatever, they all are saying the same things and they're just not getting it. And our elected representatives are not getting it. And like I said before, we have to reform our voting system, our electoral system, to get these corrupt politicians out of power and start helping regular everyday people. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Oh, I've had so many great experiences. My wife and I traveled to uh, Teleco Village, met some wonderful seniors, and they were aghast at my opponent's terrible record on senior issues, and I, I went down to uh, Lenora City for Spring Fling and had a great time. But I think my favorite event was right here in, in, in Knoxville. I was at an event, and I was you know, usually introducing myself to people, and one guy said, you running against Burchett? And I said, yes, I am. And there was a long pause, and he said, I was in high school with him. And there was a really long pause, and I figure I'm going to get it right now, right? And he says, do me a favor, beat the crap out of him, will you? <laughs> and that's been my favorite moment so far. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Uh, now, maybe on a more serious note, maybe you can share with us somebody that had a personal deep influence in you and your life, and maybe you could share with the audience uh, what you took away from that experience or that, that relationship. Yeah, and Dr. Harmon, if you first, you first please. Uh, so many women are responsible for the man you see before you. My mother was, she died three years ago, but she was an amazing force. Even people to whom she was not related called her mom. Uh, she, had, she was a four, about four foot ten, and she had a 20 foot maternal streak. She was so important, she valued education, and that's, I think, why I'm still an educator. Um, and my sister is an amazing person, um, raises money for a school. My wife is the most incredible person I've ever met. But the woman I'm gonna mention right now might surprise you. Uh, when I lived in Texas, I had the chance to meet Molly Ivins. And she was a hoot, and she became a friend. And I gotta tell you, no person stood up to the good old boy network, and with more humor, and with more guts, and just delight to be with, than the late, great Molly Ivins. Uh, she's been gone a while. I still miss her terribly much. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Well, uh, it's so hard to choose. Uh, I grew up, I had a great grandmother that lived through the Depression and World War II, and I used to love going in there and telling stories, and uh, I had two other amazing grandmothers. Uh, but I, I think I have to mention my parents here. Uh, becoming a father, I, I've got two kids, one's six and one's two, and they're such a handful. And it's only now I realize how much my parents sacrificed for me to be where I am today. Uh, my dad was a truck driver, my mom is a teacher, and I, I just can't imagine what they had to go through. They grew up both very poor and how well they turned out just all the hard work they'd done. And I didn't realize it until I became a parent how much they really sacrificed for me and how much I appreciate it. But uh, that that has to be who I call out. Thank you both. At the moment you've been waiting for, uh, we have final comments. You'll each have 90 seconds to share any concluding remarks that you'd like to share with the audience. Mr. Parsons, we'll start with you. Uh, well, uh, if you can't tell, I am not a politician. I am just a regular person who saw a need in our community and wanted to step up and try to help. Um, I have a few ideas and I've seen from our current representative what you don't need to do. Uh, and I want to help everyone in here, every Tennessean. And I have a list of things that I have focused on, on how to help our budget, how to help our election system. Uh, my website's tn1.us. You can go on there and read all about it. Uh, 
I think the most important thing that everyone can take away from here today is go vote. On my website, there's a link to the Tennessee registration. You can get on there and register if you're not registered. But everyone needs to vote. And I know that if you're here, you really care about the issues. And uh, we have got to start voting. Uh, we have really low levels of voting here, East Tennessee. And I want to see that improve. And I, I think it will. I think we have good candidates here. And I hope that we can get a good turnout and elect some better representation. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Earlier tonight, I heard the governor say that the rule of law is really important in Tennessee. Has he taken a good look at the supermajority? Half these guys are under average, the other half are under indictment. I'm running a campaign against the corrupting influence of corporate cash and against a terrible congressman named Tim Burchett, and I'm offering a better alternative. My web website is markharmonforcongress.com. But I think, you know, I slammed Tim Burchett a lot tonight. And under the rules, he would have been allowed 30 seconds to respond. But he's not here. I checked the congressional schedule. Yeah, they're in session, but there's nothing going on this afternoon. There's plenty of good flights. Both of our opponents should have been here. So let me suggest that Tim Burchett and your opponent accept our challenges. I want us to have debates in September near the election, televised. You can have a traditional format like this. You can have a town hall. You can invite the ind independent candidate. I don't care. But I want to debate this man head to head and give each one of you an honest choice. Because right now, Tim Burchett is running on an R behind his name and a bunch of corporate cash underneath his butt. And that's not good enough. You need a congressman who will stand up for you. I did that on county commission. Let's put it this way, crisis reveals character. My opponent on that terrible January 6th voted with the insurrectionists. On Black Wednesday, I voted with the community and testified for three hours on behalf of those who wanted sunshine and openness. Gentlemen, thank you. Let's give both candidates a round of applause. Thank you, Mike. To see, I want to thank all of you for being here. It's our mission to promote civil discourse and, and uh, civic engagement. And to do that, we need participation. We need people to participate in the democracy that we've created. I, I think one of our candidates just mentioned about low voter turnout. This last primary election in Knox County, many of you are probably residents of Knox County and hopefully voted in Knox County, but we only had 8% of the population that were registered actually turn out to vote. A democracy can't be successful with that type of turnout. You being here is a start. Uh, tell your friends they should be participating in these. We're gonna be doing these all across the state and a whole range of other things, but um, it just means a lot that you guys are here. I appreciate you being here. Hope you have a good evening and hope to see you at some other events in the near future. Thank you.